So there have been some different ideas of how succession works and I'd like to look at a couple of different models with you in this little lecture. Here's a diagram from a website from forestry program showing a typical sequence of secondary succession in abandoned fields in the eastern United States. First annual plants grow, then longer lived perennials and grasses come in, then shrubs move in as nutrients are increasing from stuff falling off the earlier plants dying, etc giving way to softwood trees, pines, for example, and then hardwood trees. You can see, though, at any stage, it's not only one kind of plant, but a mixture with others dominant. Over succession, we can observe some trends. Biomass increases, productivity increases, then decreases in the climax community. Nutrient cycles get tighter, New diversity, that means that more nutrients are produced, but they're also taken up more quickly. The diversity of plants usually increases. Things change from predominantly fast-growing species to more slow-growing species. Fewer interspecific interactions between plants or plants and other things to more interactions later in succession. And short-lived species are replaced by longer-lived species. And litter, leaves falling off of plants, plants dying in the system goes from low to high as there's more plant biomass present. So in succession, what determines which species come into succession and what determines when a species leaves a successional sequence. It's interesting to note that succession proceeds similarly in similar places, in similar systems in different places. And this repeatability suggests that there's some set of common underlying mechanisms. But people don't agree on what those mechanisms are. It's one of the most interesting, fun to think about areas in plant ecology. And I want you to keep in mind that these models that people propose are just simplified approximations of a process. They aren't meant to explain everything, to pro but to provide a starting point for studying something as complex as succession. So the first model I want to consider is called relay floristics. And the idea here is that after a major disturbance, one or a few species come in, then they give way to a set of other species, overlapping a very little bit, and after a while, another set of species comes in, etc., etc. So one group of plants, by changing the environment with their presence, facilitates the establishment of the next group. So that's why relay floristics is sometimes called facilitation. The other model, initial floristics, differs, although you may see the same patterns predominating. The assumption here is that all species are always present, just that different ones assert dominance at different stages in succession. This model shows every species present almost at the beginning with no additional ones arriving. So almost any set of data that have been collected can be looked at and you can see both patterns. One example is Egler's work on old field succession in North Carolina in the 1950s. After field abandonment, each of these green blobs represents a single species of plant. And here, for example, where it's thin, there aren't too many, and then there are more, and then there are fewer of this one species. So to simplify things here, three species of annual forbs, one more dominant at the beginning, 
and this one more dominant later, or more abundant, I shouldn't say dominant. And then they give way to these perennial forbs and grasses who overlap very little with the shrubs that come in. And here's a shrub that started off with greater abundance and then became more sparse while other species were more common, giving way finally to the trees, three tree species in this system. Here's an example of inhibition. The broom sedge co out competes others by its um, rampant, rhizomatous, vigorous growth. You can see that plants do better the farther they are from a broom sedge. The bigger, more plant weight and more water because the broom sedges are really water hogs. In this study, people found that plants and fungi that were co-evolved, native to the same place, showed the strongest effects on one another, both positive and negative effects. In the first graph, you can see that certain plants do much better when they're with certain fungi. So the above the line, are mutualistic interactions promoting growth of the plants. Below the line, parasitism, which makes the plants grow less. But in the right-hand graph, you can see that if the two species came from the same area, on the left graph, the interactions were, the benefits and losses were much greater than in this second graph, where partners were not co-evolved. So there's some other ideas, models of succession. Tillman is a champion for resource change availability. And see, he thinks species change because they have different tolerances for deficiencies. And changes in resource availability drive succession as more resources become available later in succession. You have species that are better competitors. Mike Houston suggested, was the first to suggest the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, making us realize that climaxes are dynamic equilibria. And in those subclimax communities, excuse me, in certain uh, communities, they're really never reaching a climax because they have frequent disturbances. So here is the picture from the dioramas we looked at in the last little lecture. After farming, the farm was abandoned and early succession begins. So I want you to think about the resource conditions at three stages of succession, early, in mid-succession, and late succession. And then think about plant life history strategies that would let plants take advantage of the resources available at each stage. So let's think about how light and resources in the soil change over time. When the field is freshly abandoned and very bare, it has a lot of light. And as plants grow up and take over, light is less available to plants at the ground level. So soil nutrients, on the other hand, are totally depleted after agriculture. Oops, I thought that would be blue. And then over time, soil nutrient resources will increase. So let's think about two different kinds of plants. Species A that needs a lot of light, species B that needs a lot of nutrients. And think about how this 
influences the kinds of plants that occur at different successional stages. That's simply an example of Tillman's resource ratio hypothesis of succession. The relative supply rates of limiting resources determine which species is dominant at a particular successional stage. Those that need a lot of light are common early in succession, but then they're outcompeted as nutrients increase in the system by those plants that need nutrients and then make shade on the light-demanding species.